Good afternoon and welcome to my third lecture for Philosophy 3200 on anarchism. This lecture is going to be about the justice system under anarchy. Now first, before I talk about how the justice system would work without a government, I want to talk about some of the problems with the current governmental justice system. So the first major problem is there are a lot of wrongful convictions in the current justice system. Uh, so there was one um, article in a law review that was published uh, several years back that did a study of wrongful convictions. And they particularly looked at cases where somebody had subsequently been exonerated after having been convicted. Um, this author found 340 wrongful convictions between 1989 and 2003. And there were, there were a variety of causes of this. Uh, there were a lot of cases of eyewitness error. These are cases where a witness claimed to have identified the person who committed a crime, but they just misidentified the person. And that's because witnesses are, in fact, a lot less reliable uh, when they're in, a, in the middle of a, a stressful event and they're looking at somebody that they don't know and they've never seen before. They're a lot less reliable at later identifying the person than people generally assume. Another common cause of problems was perjury by prosecution witnesses, including by the police. Uh, expert witnesses that would be hired by the prosecution and jailhouse snitches. So these people would just simply get on the stand and lie because the prosecutor wanted them to. The police would lie in order to get somebody convicted who the police assumed was guilty but uh, perhaps did not actually know to be guilty. Uh, expert witnesses would lie because the prosecutor would hire witnesses to come and uh, they won't get hired to come to any future trials if they don't say things that the prosecutor wants to hear. And then they have these jailhouse snitches who um, they would basically get another criminal to say that uh, this you know, defendant confessed to them and then the, um, the, the person who testifies would get a reduction in their own sentence. All right, so that caused a lot of false convictions. There were also a number of cases of false confessions and this would be where the police browbeat somebody into confessing to a crime that they didn't commit. They would commonly do this to um, mentally disabled people or um, uh, they would sometimes do it to underage people. Uh, and so this, uh, when you looked at when you look at the cases, uh, it included a large number of death row cases. It also included a number of rape cases um, because reliable DNA testing came into widespread use in this time and then they started re-examining re old cases. Uh, they included a lot of the death row population, so about 2% of the death row population was exonerated during this time period. And uh, the reason for the overrepresentation of these cases is that when a person is convicted of a capital crime, and especially when they're sentenced to death, then there's a lot more scrutiny of their case. And it's a lot easier to get outside people to look at the case and um, try, to, try to look for evidence of who actually did it. And in lesser cases, you just can't get people to look at it. So um, what this means is there are probably uh, many people who are wrongfully convicted of other crimes, but we just don't, don't find out because uh, it's very difficult to get anyone interested in your case if you're, you know, you're sitting in prison unless it's a death penalty case. Okay, now um, even, even for the death penalty cases, probably the majority of cases go, uh, the majority of wrongful convictions go undiscovered. And uh, if you just think about it, if you think about um, suppose that somebody was going to be wrongfully convicted of a crime. Uh, in order to be exonerated later, what would have to happen is new evidence would have to appear that was not available at the time of the trial. And there would be a heavier, there would be a burden of proof for the person who's trying to overturn the conviction. So it would be much harder after trial has occurred uh, to, to try to get somebody off for a crime. Uh, and um, it's difficult to get people interested. Um, if you're just on trial, it's easier to investigate a crime. But if you're, you've already been convicted and you're in prison, it's harder to investigate the crime. You have to get somebody outside to investigate it. But since you're a convicted murderer, not that many people are interested in your case. Um, and uh, it's also harder to collect evidence you know, long after the fact. So if somebody gets wrongfully convicted, they probably will not later be exonerated. 
they will probably just uh, spend their life in prison or get executed, whatever the sentence is. So the conclusion we should draw is the actual rate of false convictions is probably um, a few times higher than the rate of false convictions that were discovered. So it's probably much more than 2% of the people in prison are wrongfully convicted. Another problem with the present system is simply that there are too many laws. So the Code of Federal Regulations is it's a very large set of books published by the federal government that lists regulations that were made by uh, federal government agencies. In the year 1960, the Code of Federal Regulations was 23,000 pages long. By the year 2010, it had expanded to over 150,000 pages. Okay, now nobody can absorb that much information. Nobody knows how many laws are in it. Um, and that, by the way, is just the Code of Federal Regulations. It doesn't include state laws. It doesn't include legislative laws. Uh, there was an interview with the economist Ronald Coast uh, many years back. And Ronald Coase was the editor of a journal called the Journal of Law and Economics. And what he said during the interview was that his journal, over the time that he was uh, editing it over the course of a couple of decades, published many studies of the effects of regulation. And basically, every time somebody studied the effects of a regulation, it was found to have overall negative effects. Uh, it would make products less well adapted to the needs of consumers. It would make prices go up and things like that. Uh, and, you know, the interviewer asked him to, so he said that he didn't think that literally all regulations were bad. And the interviewer asked him to um, name a regulation that had good effects and he couldn't name one. Uh, a recent study estimated that the total cost of uh, federal regulations on the U.S. economy is probably around $1.9 trillion per year, uh, which you understand is a fair amount of money. Uh, you understand that a trillion dollars is a million times a million. So imagine there's a, million, a pile of a million dollars, and then now imagine there's two million piles of those. These regulations also tend to favor big business over small businesses. The reason for this is partly that uh, big businesses have a lot more influence on the content of regulations. So a uh, big business can afford to and will send lobbyists to Washington to try to influence laws and regulations. And uh, small businesses will not do that. They will just not have the money to do that. Uh, and so the big businesses will influence the regulations to make things harder for their small business competitors. The other thing is regulation is just inherently harder on small businesses because it creates a large fixed cost for operating in a particular business. Basically, you have to hire expensive lawyers to help you figure out how you can comply with all the regulations. Uh, and the regulation, complying with the regulations typically involves a significant fixed cost. Um, and by a fixed cost, I mean a a cost of a certain magnitude that you have to take uh, just to operate in the industry at all, but it doesn't increase as you increase your production. So if there's a significant fixed cost, that tends to exclude small businesses from operating, uh, but it's okay for big businesses. They can sustain it. Another one of the problems with the government court system is the extreme expense of using the court system. Average legal fees are typically around $300 an hour. If you want to get a divorce, for example, it's typically going to cost something between $15,000 and $30,000. And this is just a prohibitive expense for most people. In addition to the monetary cost, government courts typically take between months and years to resolve disputes. It's for this reason that a lot of private companies try to have their disputes resolved by private arbitrators instead of going to the government court system. Now, notice that one of the problems with having such an expensive court system is that it makes the court system potentially a tool of injustice. Because what you can do is uh, people can threaten other people with legal action. And even if you're in the wrong, you can threaten another person with legal action. And you can threaten to basically bankrupt another person by taking them to court, even if you know that you're wrong and that you're going to lose a lawsuit because the other person will have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to defend themselves. And if they can't, uh, if they can't afford to hire a lawyer, then they just have to give in.
Okay, another problem with our justice system is a very widespread use of imprisonment. So the United States in particular now has the highest incarceration rate in the world. We use this for a lot of a lot of things. A lot of things that somebody does that the government disapproves of, they get sent to prison for. This has gone up a lot in the last few decades. Uh, and uh, it's just much higher incarceration rate than any other country in the world. Uh, the problems with this are, first of all, there's a lot of prison abuse. We don't know exactly how much because there's kind of a culture of no snitching among criminals and especially prisoners. So they don't want to say what abuse they might have suffer suffered at the hands of the guards or other prisoners. Uh, another problem is that criminals who are imprisoned, they actually become more dangerous while they're in prison. They do not get rehabilitated. While they're in prison, they learn new criminal skills from the other criminals that they're stuck there with, you know, interacting with these other criminals all, all the time, every day. They make new criminal contacts, which they can use after they get out of prison. They might acquire more resentment to society as a result of the abuse that they suffer while in prison, and they absorb antisocial values to an even greater extent than they already have because they are in a community completely surrounded by criminals, by other criminals, all the time, every day. Now, this might explain partly why uh, after criminals get out of prison, they, um, they commit more crimes. So within three years of being released from prison, about two thirds of convicts will be arrested again for another crime. Um, that's just the ones who the police actually catch, by the way. And uh, there may be many more, uh, maybe a much larger majority of them are committing crimes and you know, not all of them are caught. Uh, lastly, notice that the current system doesn't do anything for crime victims. That is, if you're a victim of a crime and the, if the police actually catch the person, which they probably won't, but in the unlikely event that the police actually catch the criminal, you won't get anything. You won't get your stuff back. You won't get compensation or anything. The criminal will just suffer in prison for a few years, but it won't do anything for you. Okay, now, as an alternative system, we could have the, uh, the anarchist idea of justice. So just, this is just the basic idea of how the justice system would work in an anarchist society. I mentioned this in, in the previous lecture, but uh, to review a little bit. Um, pe so people are going to continue to have disputes periodically in an anarchist society, as occurs in any society, of course. Uh, one type of a dispute is where one person accuses a second person of a crime, but the second person denies that they did it. So then they have a dispute uh, about what actually happened. Uh, another type of dispute is maybe one person thinks a second person owes him money and the second person just disagrees. Okay, so you know a variety of different kinds of disputes can occur and they have to be resolved somehow. And the idea of the anarchist system of justice is that there would be a system of competing private arbitrators. This is, I should say, the anarcho-capitalist uh, conception of justice. Um, of course, the anarcho-socialist conception would be different. Uh, they would not have competing courts. Okay, but in the anarcho-capitalist system, there would be competing private arbitrators who could be operating in the same geographical area. Uh, the people who have a dispute would choose an arbitrator and they could do this by for example alternately crossing names off a list where you know you cross off your least favorite arbitrator and then they cross off their least favorite arbitrator until you arrive at one left uh, and then after a dispute gets resolved by the private arbitrator the security agencies of the of both people would enforce the arbitration results so that's the idea of how the system should work now I'm going to turn to uh, questions and objections that you might raise about this system. So the first thing that you might wonder is, well, what is going to ensure the integrity of the arbitrators? In other words, what's going to ensure that they make fair and objective decisions? And the answer to that is basically competition. So there's no competition among government courts, but there would be competi competition among these private arbitration agencies because there would be many different agencies that people could choose from. And so uh, what you would want if you're running a, an arbitration company is you would want to have a reputation for fairness in the society in general. 
so that your name would not quickly be crossed off the list when people are choosing an arbitrator to resolve their dispute. Right, and so you have to you have to try to make decisions that outside observers generally regard as fair, so that you can have a good reputation, so that future people will not cross you off their lists. Uh, and you know, if you contrast this with the government court system, there's nothing like this mechanism. So, what would prevent the government courts from being unfair or irrational or inefficient? Uh, and the answer to that is basically nothing. <coughs> Here's a second objection that you might raise. Well, will nefarious corporations maybe hire arbitrators who always find in their own favor? And you know, suppose suppose when you're dealing with a corporation, either you become an employee or you become a customer of some big company. Maybe they would make you sign an agreement that says if you have a dispute, it will be arbitrated by their own private their own private arbitrator who works for them. And then they would direct the arbitrator to always find in their favor. Would this happen? Now, uh, the first thing to understand is, um, you know, private companies, however large they are, are not omnipotent. They can't do just anything. Uh, if they could do just anything, then they would charge for their whatever product they're providing. They would charge all the money in the world. Uh, why do they not do that? And the reason they don't ask for all the money in the world for their product is that, uh, well, people wouldn't buy it. And uh, just generally speaking, there's a particular price that you have to charge in order to maximize your profits. It's the market price. If you charge too much, then people go to your competitors and basically you lose money. If you charge too little, then you're just foregoing extra profits that you could have made. So there's an optimum price, right? And a key point is that um, charging more than the optimum price results in losing profits. You don't just like make more money by charging more money no matter what. It results in losing profits because people will uh, not buy it. They'll buy less of it and more perhaps from your competitors or simply not buy the product at all. Okay, and then the, and the second thing to understand is that you know anything that the company does that customers don't like is equivalent to it's equivalent to increasing the price, right? It's creating a cost for dealing with that company. So it's comparable to just increasing the price of the product, right? Or uh, if it's a company dealing with their employees, um, adding conditions that the employees don't like is equivalent to lowering the wage, right? Just making the job less desirable. So the same logic that explains why you don't charge an infinite amount of money for your products also explains why you don't just, uh, without limit, add conditions to dealing with your company that customers wouldn't like. Okay, now imposing conditions that customers would regard as unfair is uh, adding a cost. That's something that customers will not like. Most customers, in fact, would like that. They would have sort of an extra disvalue for that. Um, they would like that even less than simply paying extra money. Right? And so it doesn't really make sense for a company to impose obviously unfair conditions on dealing with them. Right? What they should do is just uh, charge the profit maximizing price for their goods and then you know, have conditions that people generally regard as fair. Uh, also, if you just look at this empirically, um, do companies in fact do obviously unfair things? Do companies in fact impose obviously unfair conditions on dealing with them? Um, actually quite the reverse. Right? So here's a, here's a type of anecdote. This is a type of thing that uh, has happened to me and could happen to you. I buy a product from Target. You can try this sometime and you will have the same experience that I do. I buy a product from Target. I take it home. I cut the packaging off and then I decide I don't like it. I don't like it anymore. I go back to Target and I go to the customer service counter and I say, take this back and give me my money back. And the person at the counter says, is there anything wrong with it? And I say, no. And they say, okay. And they give me my money back and they take the product back. Okay, now in this dispute, if you want to call it that, I have a completely unreasonable position. I have no case for why they should take the product back. After cutting the packaging off, I know that they can't resell it, right? Or they'll have to repackage it and resell it at a discount or something like that. There's nothing wrong with the product. It wasn't misrepresented either by Target or by the manufacturer, right? I just have no case for why they should take it back, but they just immediately take it back, no questions asked, right? 
And that's my experience with private companies in the in you know the United States economy, and uh, you know if you try this, that will happen to you as well. Uh, of course, there will be some limit to it. If you go back there every day doing this, then at some point they will probably stop taking your taking your products back. Okay, here's another question. Um, well, why would people accept arbitration in the first place? Why would people even agree to go to a private arbitrator? Uh, and the basic reason for this is your contract with your security agency, as described in the previous lecture, would probably specify that you have to accept dispute resolution by a, by a neutral third party arbitrator uh, in order for your protection agency to agree to protect you. Um, they might they will probably have a clause in your in the agreement with you that says they are not responsible for protecting you if you refuse to go to arbitration. Why would they have this clause? Because it just makes economic sense. Because resolving disputes through violence is extremely expensive and very inefficient. The best way of resolving disputes with the least total overall cost, and also, by the way, typically the fairest way, is to go to a third party arbitrator. So uh, security companies are not going to be responsible for protecting people who uh, intentionally go to violent conflict instead of resolving things peacefully. They just won't want to have that expense. Now you might ask, after the arbitrator renders their decision, why will you obey it? Why don't you just like, you know, if, if the arbitrator says that you owe money to the other person, why don't you just like refuse to pay it? Uh, and the answer to that is, first of all, that uh, then you would you would be ruining your own reputation because uh, any third party, even even if they would have agreed with you uh, in your original dispute, any third party will think that you're acting unfairly and unjustly if you refuse to follow the arbitrator's decision after you agree to go to that arbitrator, right? That is, almost everyone will think that that is an automatic proof that you're in the wrong. Uh, violating the arbitrator's decision will also, uh, it just defeats the point of going to arbitration in the first place. The reason why you would go to arbitration is to, to avoid going into violent conflict. If you go to arbitration and then refuse to obey the decision, then what's the point of that? Then you're just re returned to the state of conflict. You would also have voided your agreement with your security agency, which means that your security agency would not be obligated to defend you, which means that the other person's security agency would be able to enforce the agreement against you, uh, to enforce the arbitration decision against you. Where will laws come from in this kind of system? Uh, so first of all, people who own a certain certain bit of property or associations of property owners, like homeowners associations or uh, associations of business owners, could specify the body of law governing the interactions on their own property. Uh, so you could have a set of rules for uh, your homeowners association. Uh, also, though, there are going to be some cases that are unanticipated. Uh, some things are going to happen that won't be covered by these rules, and in those cases, the um, the arbitrators, in the case of a dispute, would just decide on uh, what the correct way of resolving that dispute was. Note that this is how the common law actually works. So there's a significant body of common law existing already in our current society. Uh, this common law originates from the British legal tradition, and uh, it applies in uh, a bunch of countries around the world which are basically influenced by Britain, including the United States, Canada, Australia, and so on. Um, and uh, this has a number of advantages over legislative law. So common law is judge-made law, right? It's the case where um, a judge decides in a particular case. A particular case comes before him, and if there isn't a previously established rule, the judge just decides on the basis of what he regards as common sense morality, how it should be resolved, and then he writes down his rationale, and then future judges look at that as the basis for their decisions in similar cases. So that's the common law. Um, the legislative law is a law that's made essentially by elected politicians uh, if you're in a democracy, or you know, it could just be made by a dictator if you're in a dictatorship. Um, and uh, there are a number of advantages of common law over legislative law. So first of all, in the case of common law, um, the cognitive demands on the lawmaker are a lot less. And this is good because you know, a normal human being cannot actually anticipate all possible situations that might occur. 
So if a legislator is trying to make laws, the legislator has to kind of try to make up a set of rules that apply to every circumstance. And those rules are just going to be applied, you know, whether they make sense or not. And the legislator just can't anticipate everything that might happen. So there are going to be some cases where the rules that a legislator makes will just not really make sense and they won't be well adapted to that situation. Uh, in the case of common law, nobody has to make Nobody has to try to make a rule that takes into account all possible situations. The, the judge just has to make a rule that, uh, that makes sense in the particular situation that's in front of him. The common law is more flexible because uh, if somebody has previously stated a rule that doesn't seem like it makes sense for the particular case at hand, it can be modified. Uh, legislative law has a problem where, you know, if a particular case comes up where the previously made rule doesn't seem to make sense, uh, people are supposed to just follow it anyway. Uh, and there's not, there's not an efficient way of avoiding having an unjust outcome occur. Um, so, you know, you can later go, you can try to go back to the legislature and have them change the law, but it's actually extremely difficult to have that happen and will typically be too late for uh, a particular court case, you know, to achieve the just outcome. Also, uh, common law is made by judges who have experience with the actual problems that people commonly face. So the judge will typically have years of experience of dealing with people who have specific disputes. And he'll have experience with seeing how things go, knowing what kinds of problems people are likely to have. Uh, legislators do not necessarily have any such experience. Uh, so the legislatures are just sitting there without experience trying to make up, you know, off the top of their head what they think would be good rules. In the common law, there's also less potential for rent seeking. So rent seeking is basically uh, trying to manipulate the law to your advantage at the expense of other people. And that happens to a large extent in our current system. So uh, people who have a lot of money and, you know, large corporations can hire lobbyists to go to uh, lobby the legislature. Just, you know, go talk to these people and get them to make rules that favor your company or favor the interests of your group over the rest of society. Uh, and so you get this kind of abuse of power problem. Uh, that, that doesn't really happen with the common law. And the reason is that the, the judge in a particular case only has authority over that case. The judge can write a decision which will apply to that case, but it won't, you know, if he makes a bad decision, it will mess up the, the prospects for the particular people in that case. So it could be unjust to those people, but he can't mess up the entire rest of society um, because, you know, um, he, he doesn't get to make a rule that everybody else has to follow unless uh, it makes sense to the other judges. But in the case of a legislature, the legislature can just vote for a law and there doesn't have to be any dispute that has come before them, right? Nobody has to have asked them to resolve anything. The legislature can just decide to make up a rule and then apply it to everyone, right? So there's a lot more opportunity there for making rules that would benefit special interest groups. And that's why there's um, a lot of this practice of sending lobbyists to try to influence the legislature. Uh, and lastly, one of the advantages of the common law system is that there wouldn't be any victimless crimes. Uh, now, some people disagree with this being an advantage. Some people actually think there should be victimless crimes. But what I have in mind here is things like uh, prostitution, gambling, recreational drug use. Uh, so these are crimes where basically if you do them, there wouldn't be anybody trying to take you to court over it. So if you're using recreational drugs, there typically would not be anybody who would sue you for that uh, or make a complaint about your doing that. Um, you know, there wouldn't be anybody who would be so upset that they would try to take you to court over it. Um, and so in the anarcho-capitalist society, basically those things would just be legal. Uh, and that would, that would reduce a lot, of the, a lot of the injustice and the overuse of the court system. Now you might wonder what kinds of punishments would criminals receive at the hands of the private arbitrators? Um, basically, most decisions would focus on restitution. So restitution is where the judge in a case orders the person who's done something wrong to pay compensation uh, to, to try to make the victim whole, right? To pay a certain amount of money that, um, that is you know, comparable to the amount of harm 
that the person caused uh, whatever it was that they did. Why would they do this? Um, basically because that's, that's the thing that makes the most sense. Um, the victims of a crime could actually get something out of it, right? They should get the compensation. In the current system where you just send the, the offender to prison, nobody gets any benefit out of that. Uh, now, if you had a system of private competing arbitrators, uh, most crime victims would rather receive compensation than just see the person who committed the crime suffer but not get any compensation. Uh, you might wonder, what about the case of crimes that cannot be compensated? So um, a person might have committed uh, a wrong that was so bad and just done so much damage that they will never earn enough money in their life to compensate for it. Um, now, uh, in some cases, they might, um, the, the victim and the arbitrator might make an agreement with the criminal for the criminal to pay partial compensation. So maybe they would just decide how much was a reasonable amount that the criminal could be expected to pay and then order him to pay that much. Uh, there are some other cases which are uh, more problematic. So suppose that you have a psychopathic serial killer who's come before the court and this person can never be released safely, right? So you think about like Ted Bundy who actually murdered about 30 women during the 1970s and he actually escaped from prison one time. And as soon as he escaped, he immediately committed more murders, right? So if you have this kind of person, you can't just order them to make compensation because like this person can never be let out. Uh, so uh, it's likely that arbitrators in some cases would actually order execution for the person um, or, you know, uh, if, if they could be let out but you just don't want them in your community, they could possibly be exiled from the community. These things would be up to the judgment of the arbitrators in the particular cases. You might wonder whether arbitrators will order excessive compensation. So they might be actually unjust to the criminals. This is a concern that not that many people have, but you know, if you value justice, um, of course, you know, criminals should not be just punished without limit. There's a certain amount of punishment that's just or a certain amount of compensation that's just to ask a criminal to pay. And you know, asking them to pay more than that is unjust. And you might worry that this might happen because you know, the security agencies and um, arbitrators, they would try to serve ordinary people. They wouldn't really be serving criminals. Uh, we discussed in the previous lecture why there wouldn't be a security agency for criminals. And so what that means is that they would be biased in favor of the interests of ordinary people, not criminals, which means the criminals would be likely to receive excessive punishment. Okay, so you might think that um, a priori. But actually, there's a, there's a certain amount of empirical evidence on this, uh, which indicates that crime victims actually are not more punitive than average members of the population. Uh, so people who've been uh, victimized by a crime typically do not favor harsher sentences for that crime than people who weren't victims of it. Um, arbitrators in general, uh, they would probably be selected to be people who had generally um, good judgment and a sense of fairness. Uh, the reason being that your arbitration company is trying to attain, um, they're trying to attain a reputation for fairness so that when there are disputes, they won't get their names crossed off the list. Remember, most disputes would probably not actually be with criminals. Most disputes, um, so like most court cases, are lawsuits, not criminal cases. So when you're hiring these arbitrators, you want people who generally make decisions that most people regard as fair in most cases, right? Which includes most of these cases involving people who are, you know, law-abiding people, but who just have a disagreement. Okay, so it's unlikely that they would hire people who would just be intentionally unjust. However, it is uh, reasonably plausible that arbitrators would commonly be biased in favor of crime victims over criminals, so they, uh, criminals might wind up getting overpunished. One thing we should note about this, though, is uh, this is not really different from the current system or, you know, the system in any country. Governmental justice systems also regularly have a problem of overpunishment, uh, and that and their problem is uh, very severe. In fact, they don't just order criminals to pay excess compensation, right? They impose sentences that are incredibly punitive.
right? So uh, there are cases of you know people getting like 20 years in prison for committing a robbery, or um, you know getting you could get 20 years in prison for a drug crime even. Uh, and uh, this is for similar reasons because uh, the governmental justice system is it's controlled. So in our society, in democratic countries, it's, it responds to the desires of voters, and voters in general are extremely unsympathetic to criminals. So that's why there's this overpunishment problem. Uh, no, no politician is ever going to get elected on a platform of being soft on crime. Right, so in fact, the government system is probably much more unjust and overly punitive than an, an anarcho-capitalist system would be. And of course, the question when you're evaluating a social system is not whether it will be perfect. The question is whether it will be better or worse than the realistic alternatives. Okay, now you might wonder, um, you know, why should we advocate for such a radical change? Why not just try to reform the government justice system? So uh, a number of the things that I've I mentioned about the problems with the government justice system, you know, people are trying to improve those. Uh, why don't we just like keep the government justice system but make it better instead of like changing to a radically new system? And um, the answer to this is, so this might be a reasonable thing to say if government failures were sort of accidental, there were just like a few accidental mistakes that the government would make, but they're not really accidental, right? They're systemic, meaning um, there's a reason built into the logic of the system why there are these problems. Okay, the problem is that the government doesn't have an incentive to seek better outcomes. They don't have an incentive to achieve justice or even to make people better off. Uh, and that's for the reasons discussed in previous lectures, right? So partly because they have a monopoly. So you have these uh, prosecutors, police, and judges who, uh, if they do something wrong, um, if they take an extremely long time to resolve a case, if they give the incorrect or unjust resolution of the case, or you know, if they just, um, they just waste a whole lot of money, uh, they do not get replaced. Right, so like the government court will not go out of business and be replaced by a competitor if they do a really bad job in all of these ways. And that's the fundamental explanation for the problems in the government system. So it's not like a minor accidental problem. It's a problem that's built into the nature of government. It's the nature of a governmental system that it has a monopoly. Uh, and uh, the anarcho-capitalist system has competition, and that's like that's the core of the difference between them, and that's the core of why the governmental system doesn't work very well. Uh, this is supported by just looking around at uh, different governmental justice systems, right? Governmental justice systems around the world just all have these kinds of problems, right? And so uh, it's not really it's not really plausible that we're going to um, easily fix the problems while keeping the fundamental structure of a coercive monopolistic system in place. All right, so my concluding thought here is uh, the best solution to the problems with the justice system is to privatize the justice system.